the Zero Hour. I, of course, am your host, Richard R.J. Escal. Anybody who's been listening to or watching this show for any period of time or following my own writing will know that I feel strongly about the power that the tech companies have over us, both as individuals and as communicators and as a society. And I've been concerned for a long time about the ability of uh, some of these organizations to affect uh, people's futures, their livelihoods, their destinies, uh, not to mention our collective destiny. Uh, and here to talk about that with us now is uh, journalist, writer, and filmmaker Ben Norton. Ben is the assistant editor of The Gray Zone. Uh, and in that uh, project, he works with uh, our friend Max Blumenthal, who's been on the show many times. He is also producer of the Moderate Rebels podcast, which he co-hosts with Max. And he has his own website, bennorton.com. And recently, um, well, I'll let him tell the story, I guess. But recently, uh, Wikipedia decided to take some sort of action against the gray zone. So first of all, Ben Norton, thanks for coming on the program. Thanks for having me. You have a great show. I've seen your interviews with Max and, and other guests. So it's always a pleasure to be here. Thanks. I appreciate appreciate that. I've been following your work for a really long time, too. So I'm glad we have the and really appreciate it. So I'm glad we have the chance to finally talk. Uh, I wish it was under better circumstances, but uh, the topic I, I wanted to address with you uh, most immediately anyway is not a pleasant one would because I've been on the receiving end of this kind of tech uh, situation. So. Uh, basically, you wrote a piece uh, that's up in the gray zone. That's thegrayzone.com. Wikipedia formally censors the gray zone as regime change advocates uh, monopolize editing. So can you just briefly let us know what happened there? Absolutely. This is part of a larger campaign of censorship by these big tech corporations. So I'm glad you situated in that context. We should, of course, understand that Wikipedia, which is run by the Wikimedia Foundation, has become a huge, essentially, corporation. I mean, it is a foundation, but the, the role that it plays is similar to the other corporations in Silicon Valley, where the Wikimedia Foundation just so happens to have its headquarters. The Wikimedia Foundation is also very heavily funded by Google, Apple, Microsoft, all the big tech monopolies. And it plays a very similar role in the management of information, the management of, of people's access to information, not only in the US, but around the world. I should stress that Wikipedia is one of the most popular websites on planet Earth. It's consistently in the top 20 in terms of highest traffic. And in terms of English language traffic, it's often in the top five websites above Amazon. So just for context, Wikipedia gets more traffic than Amazon. And of course, there are different languages for anyone who knows Wikipedia. There, there's German, French, Arabic, Spanish, but by far the most popular version is English. So what, what we're talking about today is the English language version of Wikipedia, which has the most articles and also which is the source of many articles in other languages, which are translated from English into the other language. So it's one of the main Main, the main sources for all of Wikipedia's content. And the way that Wikipedia works is it's ostensibly decentralized, right? That's the branding we've been sold. Since, since Wikipedia was founded in, in 2001, nearly 20 years ago, and has marketed itself aggressively as this democratic platform that allows anyone to edit it, that was kind of true in the early days, but for well over a decade now, it has been really ossified Edits are done by a very small handful of people. In fact, a scholarly study found that over 10 years, looking at Wikipedia edits on English, the English language version, they found that 80% of edits were done by just 1% of users. So the vast, vast majority, four-fifths of, of edits are done by 1%. And who are those editors? Well, there are certainly average people, but it's very well known that, that those primary editors include 
corporate PR flax. There are numerous firms of people who are paid to edit Wikipedia articles. It's their job to do PR for their clients. So past clients who have paid Wikipedia people to PR firms to airbrush and edit their articles include Facebook itself and Facebook CEO, Sheryl Sandberg, has, has been involved in that. And also NBC, the corporate media giant, and many other companies, many other institutions, state agencies. There are also many cases of government agencies who have been involved in editing Wikipedia. The CIA has been caught many times from CIA headquarters. FBI operatives have been caught editing Wikipedia frequently. Other states, Saudi Arabia, Israel, I mentioned in the article that in Israel, a far-right, very extreme minister, Naftali Bennett, actually went on camera and boasted several years ago that they were hosting a, a, a training session to teach people how to, to do what he referred to as pro-Israel editing. He referred to it as part of a propaganda battle of Hasbara, of prop Israeli propaganda, and they even acknowledged, as was reported in the Guardian newspaper, that this Israeli council was hosting a competition for the best Zionist editor, the, the most pro-Israel editor. So, of course, it's become, over the years, as I said, totally ossified, dominated by a small percentage, one percentage of users. And in English, we're talking around 3,000 editors who do the vast majority of the edits. So it's very few people. And it, they're almost entirely anonymous. So we don't know who are actual people who are dedicated to trying to curate people's access to information, or if they are these paid PR flax, if they're corporations, if they're state intelligence agencies. So that's the overall situation that we're in. I, I just We need to understand that context before we talk about the censorship, because the censorship is already scandalous enough, but I think a lot of people don't understand how much Wikipedia has become, frankly, an astroturf operation. Yeah, I think that's yeah, a I really important, important point, Ben point. Martin. And, and I guess I would add to it, just as an observation, that it strikes me as ironic that the distributional curve for Wikipedia has come to closely resemble the distributional curve for wealth in our economy, where 1% uh, you know, hold the vast majority, in this case, of influence rather than wealth, but because uh, presumably they're being paid to influence that they have the time to do all this work and dominate the discourse that's taking place or the perception of reality that's being formed on Wikipedia. Yeah, absolutely. And I, w I would say that that's not necessarily a coincidence. It could potentially be by design or it just simply could reflect the conditions of the economic, political, technological system that we all live in. I, I, say, I say it could potentially even be by design because another article that I wrote with my colleague Max Blumenthal, which is a secondary piece, it's part of the series that we pu published on Wikipedia at the Gray Zone. The second article looks at the founder of Wikipedia and right. also the executive director and CEO of the Wikimedia Foundation who are respectively Jimmy Wales, the founder, and then the CEO's Catherine Maher. I'll talk more about them later, but I'll just mention that this, the founder, Jimmy Wales, was a former trader. He was involved in Wall Street and involved in trading stocks and, and other things, and he w considered himself a tech entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneur, like many of these Silicon Valley startup founders. And what was his political ideology? It was expressly objectivism. He is a strong supporter of Ayn Rand to such a degree that for many years, he's kind of toned it down in recent years, but from the beginning of, of founding Wikipedia in 2001, and for many years for the next subsequent decade, Jimmy Wales constantly name dropped Ayn Rand in his interviews. He talked about her book, The Fountainhead, and how the characters in it which are just kind of right-wing libertarian cookie cutter stereotypes, how they influenced his worldview and also influenced the idea he had behind Wikipedia, which he saw as this kind of weapon against state censorship, ostensibly that's the way he kind of framed it, which is also ironic because it's become 
really so dominated by U.S. government narrative since then. And, and you ben can find, ben I show the article, Norton. you can find a video that was posted, in fact, by one of the main Ayn Rand think tanks posting a video of Jimmy Wales boasting of how Wikipedia was inspired by objectivism. So here's irony number two, Ben Norton, that uh, uh, the Ayn Rand uh, acolytes and cultists uh, all seem to uh, preach this idea that uh, if the government is uh, destroyed or restricted, that free market principles will come to the right outcome for society, and they all wind up allowing the few to dominate the many, um, So, which hardly seems competitive at all, seems anti-competitive. So uh, it seems to me that the more you talk about it, the the more it seems like an unfortunate microcosm of a, the worst in our political economy to, right now. Yeah, and I would go even further. I would highly recommend the book, book of, a, of a journalist named Yasha Levine. He wrote one of the most interesting and important books of, of recent years called Surveillance Valley. And he talks about the origins of these big tech corporations, these monopolies, the, the new monopolies that control the tech-centered economy, not just in the U.S., but in much of the world. And Yasha Levine showed how from their earliest days, Google, all of these companies have been working directly with the U.S. government and some of the most oppressive authoritarian institutions, specifically in the case of Google. Yasha Levine shows how Google has, for instance, helped provide technology to the U.S. Army when it was mil mil militarily occupying Iraq. It also has provide, provided assistance and is a contractor with the CIA. Google also helps police departments surveil people, engage in mass surveillance. Google launched a spy satellite in conjunction with the Pentagon. Google has also built robots for the military. So I think that's why I began this discussion talking about the importance of the fact that the Wikimedia Foundation is based in Silicon Valley and is funded by these same big tech corporations because I think we, we, we can't let the fact that Wikipedia is run by a foundation, a nonprofit, distract from the fact that it is still part of that Silicon Valley bubble. Even if it's not ostensibly making profit, it's still part of the same role, it's part of the same institution that these big tech corp corporations represent. Yeah, I think it's a great point. Again, we're talking with Ben Norton, who is uh, here represent journalist and, and filmmaker, who is here representing uh, the gray zone and their recent experiences with, as well as writings about Wikipedia. So uh, Ben, maybe this is a good time to having set the stage to pivot a little bit to uh, what the gray zone has experienced with Wikipedia. Absolutely. So I mentioned that editing on Wikipedia is controlled by 1% of editors, essentially. Many articles are in fact locked so especially controversial political issues, which tend to be many political issues that are relevant today. So in order to edit one of these articles, you have to have a certain number of edits, a few hundred or a few thousand edits, a certain amount of time on the platform. And there are different degrees of locks. So there are also institutions that are mechanisms, mechanisms built into Wikipedia that make sure that these editors maintain control specifically over politically sensitive topics. And one of those topics is, is, well, one of many topics is Venezuela. If you look at Venezuela related issues on Wikipedia, there's frequently what people refer to as an edit war. An edit war is where different editors will change something and then change it back and change it back and forth every day, every few hours. So what happens is that admins and there are very few administrators on Wikipedia, they will lock the page, and then there's a discussion going on, what's called the talk, the talk page. And the talk page is publicly available. Now, I mentioned that Wikipedia is not at all democratic. Maybe in the early days, for a few years it was, but at this point, the internal democracy has been utterly wrecked. But what is true about Wikipedia is that it's transparent. So you can see all of the edits. They are publicly made, Although, like I said, most of the editors are anonymous. 
So if you look at a lot of Venezuela issues, you can see, for instance, Juan Guaido, which is recognized as the president of Venezuela, according to Wikipedia. And if you look at the different edits going on, you can clearly see that there are particular editors who are strong opposition supporters. They spend all day long editing not just the Guaido article, but a variety of Venezuela-related articles, always pushing the line of the right-wing Venezuelan opposition. Well, it just so happens that some of these editors initiated a process to blacklist citation of the gray zone on Wikipedia. Now, because Wikipedia is ostensibly the open encyclopedia, what that means is that when editors, even though they're tightly controlled, the few editors who do edit, they have to cite an external source with a citation. And the citation has like a footnote as in a scholarly book. So there is a list of media outlets and sources that are considered legitimate for editors to cite in an article. And who makes that list of what's considered a le legitimate sources? It's the same small gang of these editors who are, many of whom are of course very politically motivated if they aren't compensated. We don't know of course if they're compensated, but at the least we know that they're politically motivated because you can tell by all of the edits they've been making over years or months. And what happened is these Venezuelan opposition supporters initiated a survey, an official survey on Wikipedia to blacklist the gray zone and the main moderator who also initiated the surveys to blacklist other websites, including Telesur, which is a left-wing pan-Latin American network, which is funded by the governments of Venezuela, Cuba, Nicaragua, and it used to be funded by other left-wing governments until they were overthrown. Telesur was blacklisted by the same group of these editors. Also, Venezuela Analysis, which is a totally independent site, independently funded. It's run by non-Venezuelans. I know them. The main writer actually is an American, a white American. But Venezuela Analysis was also blacklisted by these Venezuela opposition trolls. And then they came for us after. So we are officially blacklisted on a Wikipedia list, which I can talk more about. But it's, it's called deprecation is the process. And what's so insidious about that is that it puts the gray zone on the same level as ridiculous websites like the Epoch Times. The Epoch Times <laughs> is also a deprecated source. For anyone who doesn't know, the Epoch Times is an insane far-right propaganda network run by a Chinese cult called Falun Gong, which believes that God sent Donald Trump to destroy China. And they also believe that race mixing is demonic. They believe that homosexuality was created by the devil and that feminism destroys society. So our investigative journalism is considered just as deprecated on the same level as the propaganda outlet of a Chinese cult. So, and there's no Ben Norton of the Gray Zone, there's no process here, it sounds like. In other words, if you deprecate it, first of all, that's a weird term, but uh, you know, there, there's no process for it that, uh, from the description of it anyway, for example, that uh, uh, an editor who wanted to downgrade or blacklist a site might have to show 10 documented cases where a site knowingly published falsified information. I mean, I'm just making it up, right? But but you think if, if the question is, uh, is, are they a valid source of information, you'd have to document that before uh, doing such a thing. Yet it sounds like there's no process. It's just this small minority of people can decide to do it and then do it. Well, there is a process technically. And technically, they do have to prove that you that this website publishes demonstrably false information repeatedly. But the thing about Wikipedia is it doesn't ever have firm rules. It has what are called guidelines. But then at the same time, one of the Wikipedia guidelines is there are no rules. And another Wikipedia guideline is ignore the guidelines if you can supposedly make an article better. So again, we see how supposedly this decentralization and the marketing that they claim the Wikipedia is so open, but actually 
the fact that it doesn't have any t actual tangible enforceable rules, yet alone mechanisms to enforce them, means that they can abuse these guidelines as editors do every single day. So to directly answer your question, Wikipedia, these, these editors, and, and I go through in the article, it's a very long article, but just to document it, I go through who the specific editors are, I show their history of partisan, politically motivated editing, and then I also show the discussion, which again is transparent. It's very hard to participate in it because it's so undemocratic, but you can see what's happening. It is transparent. So if you look at the conversation, there's very little discussion of the actual journalism we published at the Gray Zone. The majority of the discussion was about the political views of Max Blumenthal, of me, and of our colleagues Aaron Mate and Anya Parampol. And specifically, they also named, oh, that we have appeared on Russian media, boogie boogie scary, that Anya previously was a presenter at RT, that, for instance, that Max took a tour to report of Syria, and that we also interviewed Nicolas Maduro, the president of Venezuela, that we have been to Venezuela. So instead of actually finding so-called falsehoods in our reporting, which there aren't, I mean, we've made small mistakes in the past, but we've never had to issue a retraction. We've never had to issue a major correction for a major detail that was central to a story. But because we have that track record and because these politically motivated editors know that we publish factual information, they intentionally derailed the conversation and made it about things that are external to our reporting, which violates the ostensible guidelines that Wikipedia is based on. But again, how is it going to enforce those mechanisms? It, it has no mechanisms. How is it going to enforce those guidelines? It has no mechanisms to enforce them. And many of these editors that are engaged in the process, including we can talk about one of the most notorious editors named Philip Cross, who edits all day, every single day for hours per day, has made hundreds of thousands of edits and specifically targets anti-war journalists, publications and politicians. And in fact, some British politicians have considered legal action against him because he just publishes defamatory smears all day long, every day. And of course, he was one of the editors that was involved in this process. And Philip Cross, this very shady, unknown editor, we don't even know if it's one person. It could be a group of people, which ostensibly violates Wikipedia's guidelines. But again, no mechanisms to enforce them. And Wikipedia says itself to ignore the rules. Well, Philip Cross also has done over three quarters of the edits on Max Blumenthal's Wikipedia article, which is which is a battleground for political propaganda. So it just once again, we see how, yeah, Wikipedia says what you said, that that would make sense. You have to prove falsehoods. But then those are just guidelines and you can ignore them and do whatever is politically convenient. And then if you can get a consensus of these editors and by the way, Wikipedia defines consensus not as what pretty much everyone else in the world would mean a consensus. Wikipedia defines consensus as basically whatever the main editor moderating the discussion or the admin decides is consensus. So all they do is look at the discussion and they say, well, there are people saying this, so there seems to be a consensus. It, it's really an Orwellian process, frankly. And what's so disgusting about it is that they're engaging in this politically motivated propaganda, editing, but then they're also engaging in censorship while simultaneously claiming to be the great democratic, open, decentralized project that that is a utopian model for the future of technology. So let me ask you a question, Ben Norton. In fact, let me ask a couple. One, I vaguely remember it might have been Philip Cross reading about somebody who was editing Wikipedia at so many hours of the day and so frequently that it seemed almost like a, a, a huge stretch to think it could be one person. But um, more to the point, I guess, it sounds like the bulk of these edits, it, let me put it this way, it doesn't sound like there's a lot of uh, 
left-wing domination of Wikipedia pages going on. It seems, it sounds, I, I don't know if you know the answer to this, it sounds like this domination by this 1% leans heavily toward the right and heavily toward, you know, if you want to call it the NATO institutional position or the intelligence community institutional position or what have you. But if A, if that's in fact the case, is it possible B, that... Um, this is even in institutionally intended on Wikipedia's part, given the, you know, Yasha Levine's been on the show and the ins insular relationship between the military and Silicon Valley. So uh, does that make sense to you, that A-B question? Well, it's a great question. I can, I'll provide an answer in two parts here. The first part is that it depends how you define right wing. To be fair, I wouldn't say that the majority of the editors are right wing, although there certainly is a, a subgroup that is firmly right wing, especially related to Latin American issues and related to Israel-Palestine related issues. Topics related to Venezuela, Israel-Palestine, Iran are extremely biased and representing the kind of neoconservative right wing position. But like you said, I think actually a more accurate description would be the kind of neoliberal centrist view that is considered bipartisan dogma. So the main sources that are considered impeachable sources would be the New York Times, Reuters, the Associated Press, the Washington Post, and also what's considered tantamount in credibility is Bellingcat. Bellingcat right. is a, a pro-NATO blog that's funded by the US government's National Endowment for Democracy, it is essentially a propaganda arm of NATO, and it represents that kind of liberal, pro-war, pro-regime change position. They're definitely not Republicans, but they would recommend they would represent the kind of centrist, even right wing of the Democratic Party or the Labour Party in Britain. And if you look at the deprecated sources, to be fair, yes, there are several leftist anti-imperialist websites like the Gray Zone, Telesaur, also Mint Press News, which is a great independent site. But to be fair, there are some right-wing websites that aren't crazy like the Epoch Times. For instance, the Daily Caller. I'm not a big fan of the Daily Caller, of course. I have a lot of problems with their editorial line. I disagree a lot with it. But I would not say that they publish regular fake news on purpose. It's not the same thing as Epoch Times, but right. the, the Daily Caller is also considered deprecated. So, uh, by the way, I should mention WikiLeaks is is blacklisted. It's not deprecated. It's a, sl a level slightly above. And the the rationale that the this cabal of editors, these neoliberal pro NATO consensus editors, they say that Wikipedia that it's not known if the documents are true, and that there is evidence to suggest that some of the documents may be false. Even though Wikipedia has a 100, Wiki, sorry, let me, let me stress, WikiLeaks, even though WikiLeaks, which has nothing to do with Wikipedia, they have a similar name, but nothing to do with each other. WikiLeaks has a 100% track record for accuracy for all of its publications, but WikiLeaks cannot be cited on Wikipedia because, again, the consensus, the editorial ideological worldview of this small group of editors just so happens to represent the kind of pro-NATO New York Times enlightened neoliberal consensus. Now, also related to that is the second part of my answer. I also don't think it's a coincidence. Of course, they would deny it, so I'll, I'll say that, but the Wikimedia Foundation also has very questionable links to the US government and the, these kinds of institutions. In fact, the executive director and CEO, whom I mentioned, Catherine Marr, she worked for a US government funded regime change agency that's called the National Democratic Institute. Institution, Institute. And the NBI, it, the acronym, is part and parcel of this regime change industry working with the National Republican Institute, with the National Endowment for Democracy, with the US Agency for International Development. These are all the wings of US soft power that were created many by the Ronald Reagan administration toward the end of the Cold War. And as the, the founder, co-founder of the NED said, Alan Weinstein, he famously said 
that what we are doing with the NED is what the CIA did 25 years ago, but we're just doing it in the open. So these groups are essentially CIA cutouts that were created toward the end of the Cold War and after the Cold War to fund so-called democracy, pr democracy promotion efforts, which essentially means color revolutions and regime, regime change. And the NED explicitly says on its website that its goal is to spread democracy and free enterprise. So what, of course, that really means is overthrowing governments that have significant state control and socialist policies over the economy and liberalizing the economies, privatizing everything and installing a neoliberal democracy in scare quotes. So the National Democratic Institute was the former employer of Catherine Marr. Catherine Marr is also a member of the Open Technology Fund. She's on the board of the Open Technology Fund, which was created by Radio Free Asia. And I'll remind people who don't know, Radio Free Asia was once described by the New York Times itself as a worldwide propaganda network created by the CIA. That's the exact term the New York Times use. Radio Free Asia is a CIA front. It's a propaganda arm that was also created after the Chinese Revolution as part of this Cold War propaganda effort. So the CIA front, the RFA, which also is linked to the U.S. Agency for Global Media, USAGM, which used to be called the Broadcasting Board of Governors. I, I know there's a lot of names and acronyms here, but the point what? is that yeah. these, these yeah. are the propaganda arms of the U.S. government. And the U.S. government, it has the soft power groups, and then it has the media groups. So the media groups created this thing called the Open Technology Fund. The Open Technology Fund was created ostensibly to spread free technology, so internet technology, things like that, but it's another front for regime change operations. And who is a member of the board of it? The executive director and CEO of the Wikimedia Foundation. Also, I swear I'm almost done with talking about this, but it's so scandalous. Catherine Marr, the head of Wikimedia, also interned at, at the Eurasia Group, which is a very obvious, very obviously linked to US intelligence agencies where she did work on Syria and Lebanon, and she interned at the Council on Foreign Relations, one of the most notorious vehicles for US imperial power. And after that, she worked at the World Bank, and at the World Bank, that brought her many times to North Africa during the Arab Spring protests. I even forgot to mention, I mean, her resume is just so mind-blowing. Her resume is like, it's like the golden, Cold Warrior resume. It can't be full of more accomplishments for Cold Warriors. She also happened to study Arabic in Syria before the the war began in Syria. And even in in Tunisia, in Tunisia, actually, a former member of the Tunisian government, a minister, accused her publicly of being a CIA agent, which she denied. But he said he found her work in Tunisia very, very strange. And I didn't even mention that she also happened to go to Libya in 2012 after NATO destroyed the Libyan government. So this is the person who is the head, who oversees Wikipedia, who is the CEO and the executive director of the Wikimedia Foundation. So we don't know exactly what what she does. We don't really know if she has any deeper links, but I can say that she is extremely suspicious. Well, so, yeah, it sounds yeah, like it. Sounds like and I think, and I think there's think also, there's um, besides, and I encourage people to read your writing about this at thegrayzone.com, Ben Dorton, but um, I also think uh, there are, well, there's so many things we could talk about. Uh, one is uh, this, uh, you know, so many uh, people I think would describe themselves as liberal Democrats have embraced Hamilton 68 and other projects to deliberately design to limit the discourse. And one of the implications of this for me uh, is that this is, to me, seems like another front in that war on freedom of speech. And as much as I object to a lot of what's written in the Daily Caller, for example, uh, 
I don't really like the idea of any private corporation, much less one run by people like this. But just as a matter of principle, these platforms have so much power over the discourse and over what we think of as public knowledge uh, and what is public knowledge or belief. Uh, I don't really like the idea of any uh, private body have the having the ability to officially, in a sense, uh, rewrite truth or render one out that, um, you know, uh, blacklisted or you know, there's something very totalitarian about it to me. There's something very inimitable, inimicable to, uh, to democracy and freedom of speech. It just it bothers the hell out of me. I don't know what else to tell you, but uh, uh, I sound like you feel the same way. Oh, wait, you, you don't think a, a private corporation should control every aspect of our life? No, I mean, it, what the, what's so crazy about it is it's not even totalitarian in the classical sense of the term. It's not a term I, I like very much because it's so abused. But what's, what's crazy is it's even worse than totalitarianism because totalitarianism, the original concept going back to World War II, is the government controls everything in your life. Right. Right, and, right. But this isn't even the government. This is a private corporation. So it's like private totalitarianism. It, it's it's unimaginable. It's a monopoly to such a degree that makes the robber barons look like like Democrats. And what's so wild about this is it's also extended beyond the realm of Wikipedia into censorship of social media the Google algorithm, the YouTube algorithm. I know the YouTube algorithm has hurt your channel. The YouTube algorithm has hurt our channel greatly at the gray zone. And that we saw this this week. Google, there was a scandal where NBC News asked Google to try to deplatform the Federalist. Like the Daily Caller, I'm certainly not a fan of the Federalist. In fact, I referred to it on Twitter as a right wing rag. I think it is a right wing rag. But I also think that they, people have the right to publish their views. And even if they have those odious, reprehensible views, like Ben Shapiro, I don't think that a private corporation should control access, pub people's access to that website. And why? Not because I like the Federalists in any way. I don't. But because if we let them do that, it establishes the precedent that they use to censor left-wing websites, which they have been doing. Google for years and, and now has been. Go ahead. By the way, Ben, uh, I'd like to say that I saw your tweet about that, but I've been, uh, let, let's shall we say, off Twitter since April 24th, and uh, they don't seem to be very eager to put me back on. So I didn't see it. I'm sorry. You were suspended. Uh, I was not formally suspended. Someone hacked my account. But they've just, despite repeated communication, decided that it doesn't need to be uh, given back to me, I guess. Wow. Well, th there are, that's a whole other uh, rabbit hole in terms of social media. And we've written a lot about that at the Gray Zone, and it's, it's, de it's equally scandalous. But, but getting, you know, as in the case of Twitter, really quickly, I'll just mention that one of the main owners of Twitter is a massive Saudi prince, Bin Talal, um, an extremely wealthy, ultra-billionaire Saudi prince, and also Twitter hired as someone that was monitoring its, that was one of its editors for Middle East content, was also a member of a psychological operations unit, a psyops unit, in the British military. So, and that was someone hired by Twitter to oversee Middle East content. So anyway, but, get, but getting back to Google, NBC News asked Google to, to, to deplatform the Federalist. Well, Google already maintains a blacklist of media outlets. We know this ironically, actually, because the Daily Caller obtained a leak of it. So again, I'm, I'm not in any way endorsing the Daily Caller, but they're blacklisting the Daily Caller and they're blacklisting us. The gray zone is blacklisted. Other websites that have been blacklisted and hurt by the Google algorithm include Mint Press News, Consortium News, Black Agenda Report, Counterpunch. So all of these outlets 
are being hurt already by Google's algorithm, and we know that Google manually manipulates search results to remove those websites from search results, which also violates what Google says it does. They lie. But it's not just Google. YouTube, which actually is, contr is owned by Google, YouTube does the same thing, and it's its algorithm. And people might have noticed over the, the past several years, especially with Russiagate and this new Cold War, more and more YouTube will recommend recommend CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, but, but won't recommend alternative media outlets. And, and this actually just reminded me of one other point that I even forgot to make, which is so deeply, utterly ridiculous. Wikipedia, by the way, on its list of deprecated media, reliable media, they have, they have this hierarchy and there's like there's bright green going down to dark red. We, we have the darkest red, the gray zone. But you know who has the brightest green? The Weekly Standard, a neoconservative propaganda magazine founded by Bill Kristol, one of the main architects of the Iraq War, an inveterate warmonger with the blood of, of frankly, over a million Iraqis on his, hand, on his hands among many other people around the world. His neoconservative website that printed lies to justify the Iraq War, one of the main promulgators of the WMD lie, the Weekly Standard is considered a reliable source with the brightest green commensurate with the New York Times and the AP, according to Wikipedia. So well, it just shows the insane double standards of these big tech corporations. Or, show, of course, and may also show that Bill Crystal knows a guy who knows a guy who's involved in this process, I guess. Um, and on, I, I mean, we could go down a million alleys with this, but Ben Norton of the gray zone, I guess I, I, my last question for you would be, so how does this affect you guys uh, as, as, uh, as an outlet uh, directly to be deprecated and, and all that? Uh, what does it do to traffic, to getting the word out? And what does it do to us as consumers of information? Well, for the first part, it, not only does it affect the gray zone as an institution, which it does, I'll get to that, but it also prevents people from getting access to important information because at the gray zone, we publish a lot of scoops that have not been picked up by the rest of the media. For instance, my colleague Max Blumenthal recently published a series of major exposés on Julian Assange detailing CIA surveillance of Julian Assange in the Ecuadorian embassy in London. We've also published many other things, documents related to the Venezuelan coup efforts. We have a lot of original, original reporting, which cannot be cited on, the great, on Wikipedia. It, it's blacklisted. So there's that element. And then there's also the fact that because the gray zone is a deprecated source on Wikipedia, it is extremely difficult to, it's basically almost impossible to, to revert that. It's final. So what that means is that we're probably never going to be able to be cited, which also means that we're probably not going to have a Wikipedia article either, even though there are other independent alternative news websites that are much smaller than us but have Wikipedia articles, but we don't. So there's also that, which is part of this blacklisting. They don't want people to know about us. So when people Google the gray zone, there won't be a Wikipedia article explaining what that is, which also hurts our credibility because it makes us look like right. a, a small outlet that, that is not important. And then, of course, it's also related to the Google algorithm because I mentioned that we already have been hurt by the Google algorithm. That's been confirmed by these leaks. But also, Google indexes Wikipedia for search results. So there's a kind of, there's a quid pro quo relationship oh, okay. between Google and Wikipedia. So if you Google pretty much any topic, whatever it is, the first result is almost always going to be Wikipedia. Wikipedia is, has one of the highest search engine optimization op standards for any website on the entire internet. And, and not only that, if you look up something, a topic, Google has a little bar on the right side, and that mm. bar is populated from information that is taken directly from Wikipedia. So it also hurts the gray zone's traffic in Google, which is, of course, by far the largest 
largest search engine. So unfortunately, the reality is that we just have to continue struggling and fighting to have that reverted, which is an extremely difficult, arduous, almost impossible process. And I will say that the last note I'll say is, of course, I believe that we need, desperately need, independent institutions and alternatives to these big tech monopolies like Google, like Twitter and Facebook. We need to create and support the existing alternative institutions, but there's a big but here. They're not really used that much. The reality is people say, why are you complaining? Just use DuckDuckGo. Why are you complaining? Right, Just right, use right. Mastodon. Yeah, but like a million people use Mastodon, whereas billions of people use Facebook. And a small percentage of people use DuckDuckGo, and the vast majority of people use Google. So we want to reach people where they are, people who we want to convince people who don't already agree with us. And in order to reach those people, we have to engage with Google and YouTube and Facebook and Twitter. But as the new Cold War, and that's what we're going through against Russia, China, as the new Cold War heats up, and as the political narrative discourse in the US becomes so hawkish and so just stultifying, so frankly ridiculous, just blaming Russia and China and Iran for everything, unfortunately, I think we're going to see a further centralization, a further censorship on all of these platforms. And that's why it's really important to speak out. And thank you for having me to speak about these issues. Well, thank well, you thank for you. Uh, for uh, being such an excellent uh, reporter and interpreter of this phenomenon. And I'm sorry you guys are going through it. Uh, it's not right. And it's something that's bothered me for a long time. Uh, so keep up the great work. Anyway, Ben Norton of the Gray Zone, uh, journalist uh, and filmmaker and musician, Keep up the great work, and thanks for coming on the Zero Hour. Thanks for your great show. Keep up the good work. And we'll be right back after this. I am Richard R.J. Escow, and this is the Zero Hour.